the text that I was given, and I will only fly over it at 36,000 feet. This is more of a, an address than a, an expository s sermon, so, so don't, don't grade me harshly. Uh, and the text was Psalm 78 and verses 70 through 72, the last three verses of Psalm 78. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance, with upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Well, I've been asked to speak on uh, pursuing pastoral integrity. And in the Oxford Dictionary, the concise Oxford Dictionary, integrity is defined as wholeness, soundness, uprightness, and perhaps more uh, importantly, honesty. Now, I can't speak on this topic without telling you that four or five years ago, my integrity was questioned, and it was a very difficult moment in my life, and I was examined by various committees, including Ligonier, but more importantly, my presbytery, and I was found not guilty of intentional plagiarism. My integrity was questioned, and integrity in ministry is, is vitally important. Now, I, uh, I'm a Calvinist, an unapologetic Calvinist, so I have five points. <laughs> so if you're, going to, um, if you're going to minister with integrity, the first thing that you need to do is to aim for total godliness. Aim for total godliness. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself. This is a very similar text to the one in Acts 20 that Dr. Parsons just alluded to. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your Hearers, keep a close watch on yourself. Now, the Greek verb is epecho, and it's the verb that's used in Acts, Acts 3 and verse 5, where Peter and John uh, in the temple meet a leper, uh, and he's asking for alms, and Peter says to him, look at us. And in verse 5, he fixed his attention on them. He fixed his attention on them. He, uh, he locked eyes on them. This leper gave Peter and John his total attention. Now, how does Timothy lock eyes on himself? Well, if you go back in 1 Timothy 4, 7, train yourself to godliness. Train yourself to godliness. And the verb is the verb from which we get our word gymnasium from. Now, somebody told me uh, a week ago, a, a member of staff, he told me that uh, his neighbor picks him up picks him up at 5 a.m. in the morning and takes him to the gym. And I said, well, there are two words in that sentence that I find objection to. <laughs> One is 5 a.m. and the other is gym. 
There is nothing about gyms that, that I like. Absolutely nothing. But that's the verb that Paul is using here. Train yourself. Discipline yourself. It's a commitment to feed and grow yourself. The daily practice of spending time in God's word and prayer. The exercise of spiritual disciplines to ensure that you walk with God. Train yourself to godliness. Godliness is a word in Greek that can also be rendered piety. Piety. Think of, think of Calvin. It's always good to think about Calvin. I look forward to meeting him. I have a ton of questions that I would like him to answer. I must have read the Institutes 30, 40 times, I'm sure. I teach a course on it, so that's why I, I read it fairly often. And um, you remember in book three, book three of the Institutes had a life of its own, uh, it was published separately and remains in print uh, to this day. Ligonier has uh, a wonderful translation that Burke Parsons was involved in on, on the Christian life. And uh, he divides it in, into three sections. What is the Christian life? Mortification. Vivification. And meditation on the future life. Putting sin to death, encouraging the graces of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and meditating on the future life, reminding ourselves that this is not our home, that we seek a city which has foundations, whose builder and Maker is God. A aim for total godliness. As Robert Murray McShane once said, be as holy as a saved sinner can be. As pastors and shepherds, we are meant to be an example to the flock an example of godliness. Whatever else they may say about you. Oh, he's a, he's a great preacher. He's a great teacher. But a better compliment would be, he's a godly man. He's one who loves the Lord and walks in his ways and fears his name. Aim for total godliness. Secondly, be a man of prayer. Be a person of prayer. So Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.1, I urge that supplications prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men. And then in chapter 2 and verse 8, I desire that in every place that men should pray. Well, that's a general command, a general desire that all men should pray, but especially, especially pastors. I've discovered how um, meaningful it is to text someone. I was, I was suspicious of it 
10, 15 years ago, it was way too trendy, too modern. But I've had people tell me, thank you for that text. They're in the hospital, they're, something has happened, something, something of a trial has come into their lives and you, you send them a text and you say to them, I'm praying for you right now. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll type out the prayer, just a sentence or two, and how meaningful that is to folk. Be a person of prayer. One of the great um, moments, I think, in the life of a pastor is the pastoral prayer on Sunday morning. And I don't know what your habit is. Maybe you write out your prayers. I, I tend not to do that. They come from my heart. And I think when you lead people in prayer, in worship, it exposes you, doesn't it? It exposes your soul. You've got six, seven, eight minutes, however long that pastoral prayer is. It's a significant part of worship, of public worship, the pastoral prayer. And you don't want that prayer to sound the same every time you pray it. You want, you want variation. But you can't, you can't do that. You can't pray an extempore pastoral prayer without a whole lot of integrity in your heart, in your soul. As you dig deep into your personal relationship with God and your knowledge of his word and the crafting of prayerful sentences that bring him glory and build up the flock of God. I was told 50 years ago that if you're a pastor in a congregation and you're there for some time, you're there for 10, 15, 20 years, many of the folk in the congregation are going to pray the way you pray. That they will, they will learn how to pray by listening to you praying on Sunday mornings. Pursuing pastoral integrity, that's our theme, requires of us that we be men of prayer. Robert Murray McShane from Dundee in Scotland, he died when he was 29. He was in ministry for barely seven years. And one of those years, he was in Palestine. Um, and from that came a mission to the Jews, a Christian witness to Israel, which still exists to this day. But you can go to Dundee and you can go into the churchyard uh, that, around, that surround it and you can go to his grave and visit the site of Robert Murray McShane. We still remember him. Six years of pastoral ministry, that's all he, he had. But we still remember him. And a visitor, an American, came to Dundee one time and wanted to see uh, Robert Murray McShane's uh, grave. And he asked the custodian who led him in to the church, he asked him, what was the secret of Robert Murray McShane? Why, why do we remember him? And immediately he answered, because 
he was a man who prayed. And in his biography, uh, and, and there are, there's more than one biography of Robert Murray McShane, that's what the biographers draw attention to. Not so much as preaching. There was only six years of it. But it was his prayers, that he was a man of prayer. Well, thirdly, if we are to pursue pastoral integrity, we need to watch out for Satan. We need to watch out for Satan and temptation. Richard Baxter, in his wonderful book, The Reformed Pastor, and that would be up in the top two or three books uh, that I would recommend for pastoral ministry and the shape of pastoral ministry, uh, Richard Baxter's uh, The Reformed Pastor. And it's based on a text in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. And he gives eight reasons for looking out for um, temptation. And number three, pastors are exposed to greater temptations than others. If Satan can make you fall, he gains most of the congregation. Sadly, I've known far too many. Uh, I can say dozen, but I can put an S on it. I think I've known dozens of pastors who have fallen. Tragically, publicly, and there go I, but for the grace of God. I remember when Jeff Thomas, some of you know Jeff Thomas from uh, Aberystwyth in Wales, and uh, he's now 80 something, but he's still coming over to the United States uh, two or three times a year. And I was fortunate enough to be a student uh, in his congregation in Aberystwyth um, 50 years ago. And um, uh, we've been friends ever since. But I remember him saying, when he'd been in ministry 30, 35 years, that he used to think that when he was young, he, want, he, wanted, to be, he wanted to be great. He wanted to be a great preacher. And, and he said, you know, I've changed my mind. I just want to finish the course and cross the line without falling, without stumbling. And I get that. Too many pastors and friends of mine, dear friends of mine, have fallen. One thinks of David and Bathsheba. It came in a season when David failed to do what he was supposed to do. It was a season of war, and his men were in battle. And David should have been at the head, but he wasn't. He was sitting on a rooftop in Jerusalem. He had put aside the reins of his leadership and was living in a backslidden state. And it's easy to do that in ministry. You can, uh, you can think of it as a, as a job. And you go to work and you go to your office and you prepare a sermon and you go and visit someone, and it's a job. It's a profession. And the fire has gone out. The embers have become dull. And like David, he saw and he fell. 
but to be like Joseph. Joseph, a young, handsome man in the extraordinary providence of God. He was in the house of the second most important and influential man in, in Egypt, in Potiphar's house. And when his wife laid hold of Joseph's garment with an intention in mind, he ran away, leaving the garment in her hands. Well, that's what I pray for. That when temptation comes, I'll run away. I will not yield. Maintaining sexual purity in ministry is an absolute requirement. And if that's a problem for you, be accountable to someone. Have someone to whom you are accountable on a weekly basis. Then four, keep a close watch on your preaching. So the text, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, and Paul is saying, uh, keep a close watch on your teaching. Didascalia. Doctrine. Theology. If you're to maintain integrity as a preacher, you need to be reading constantly. I have to admit that I get disappointed when I, when I go into pastor's offices and you look at the library and you glance at it and you, you say to yourself, yeah, all of these books were bought when this guy was at seminary. And the only book on the desk is some book on leadership. Keep a close watch on your teaching. Read and read and read and read and read and read. You can't have too much of it. Do you remember Paul in 2 Timothy? This is Paul writing from uh, the Marmotine prison in Rome. This was his third and final imprisonment. He's perhaps weeks away from being taken to the Ostian Way and beheaded. And he writes to Timothy, his protege, who's in um, the church at Ephesus. And he wants Timothy to come to him. I don't think Timothy ever made it. And do you remember what his request was? He wants a blanket because it's cold. The conditions that Paul endured in prison were terrible, awful. Some of you, like myself, have been to Rome, been to what purports to be the Marmotine prison. It's just a, it's just a hole in the, in, a, in, a, in the ground, and it's just rock. That's all it is. But he wants Timothy to bring the books and especially the parchments. Now, there's some debate among scholars as to what the distinction between books and parchments. Books might be a rough translation for his notebooks. We sometimes have the impression that Paul just wrote and by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, voila. 
But I imagine Paul making notes too. Crafting sentences and paragraphs. And the parchments, these were probably scrolls of the Old Testament scriptures. He's weeks away, at most months away from death, and he still wants the books and the parchments. To the very end. What book have you read this year that's weighty? And I mean, I mean read. Now, I have to admit, I don't read books the way I used to. I, I skim certain chapters, and I read what I think are significant chapters, and I typically read the last chapter and the conclusion. Um, have you read a systematic theology this year? From cover to cover, there's a, there's a challenge. And there are many of them, and, and you now have Bavink in English. Imagine, are we Dutch people here? Of course, we're. So I have to tell you, I've fallen in love with Bavink. When I was at seminary, in the 70s, uh, my systematic professors uh, quoted a lot of Bavink, but that's because they were able to read Dutch. But within the last 10 years, Bavink's writings have been translated into English, and there are, there are cheat ones, cheat with a T, a, a, a summary of his of his writings in one volume, there's a challenge. Keep a close watch on your teaching. And then, fifthly, Paul says to Timothy, persist in this. Persist in this. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame. Do you remember what Paul said to Timothy? By so doing, you will save yourself. In the sense of saving yourself from falling. When you, have, when you walk in integrity, you will save yourself from falling. But you, have a, you and I have a responsibility. We are to persist in it. We're to be like that Duracell bunny that keeps on going. I have an alarm system in my house. It's not a very good one. And uh, there are little gadgets on the windows that if somebody opens the window, it'll, and the alarm will go off. But these little, little gadgets have little batteries in them. And I am forever changing them. <laughs> First of all, it says window number three, and I'm not sure which window number three is. <laughs> Is it three from the left or three from the right? Or is it talking about the ones in the kitchen? Persist in this. A preacher with integrity, a, a preacher that you respect. You respect him for who he is and you respect him for what he is. McShane once said, and in the church in Dundee, um, you climb up oh, half a dozen, maybe more, stairs in order to get into the pulpit. And back in the day, in the late 19th century, there would have been a lamp burning 
and it would cast a shadow on the back wall. Our integrity should cast a shadow on the wall. That above anything else, as you assess this person, you say, this person is an upright man, a man of integrity. Well, let's pray. Father, we fall so woefully short of the standards that you lay down for shepherds and preachers. And we pray that we, you would help us to persist in godliness, to maintain integrity in all that we do and say, that we might be honest, that we might love you with all of our hearts and love your people with all of our hearts. Help us, we pray, to walk close to you day by day so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we might save ourselves from falling and our people that we feed and nourish. And all of this we ask in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.